Good evening, welcome. Uh, my name is Patrick Mason. I'm the Dean of the School of Arts and Humanities at uh, Claremont Graduate University, and it is my distinct honor and privilege to welcome you to this poetry reading tonight, which is part of the Tufts Poetry Awards. Uh, thank you all for coming here tonight. We're in this uh, spectacular venue, and I can't wait uh, for uh, the poetry that we're going to hear this evening. So I represent the institution, Claremont Graduate University, that for 26 years has been the proud home of the Tufts Poetry Awards. I've been thinking a little bit about institutions in recent years. It's sort of a boring topic to think about, but I've been thinking about it for a few years, ever, ever since I first visited Italy a few years ago. One of the thoughts that impressed upon me as I walked around Florence was how the artists and the scholars whose glorious work I was reveling in and that impacted Western civilization so significantly did not appear in a vacuum. Botticelli, Galileo, Michelangelo, Da Vinci, Raphael, Giotto, and many, many others. They were all part of schools and academies, urged on and supported and challenged by one another and sponsored by visionary patrons. Rather than laboring in isolation, they worked in and were part and, 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 and were in many respects the products of institutions that sustained the kind of artistic and humanistic community that allowed their particular individual genius to flourish. Those institutions not only nurtured multi-generational artistry, but also provided spaces where important and often challenging work would be protected and preserved. So tonight we gather thanks to the convergence of three essential institutions that nurture, sustain, and protect the arts and humanities in our current American culture. The Huntington Library and Gardens, one of the great temples of beauty and knowledge in the Western United States. Claremont Graduate University, a graduate-only research university in the tradition of the liberal arts. And of course, the Tufts Poetry Prize which over the past 26 years has become a prestigious and not merely lucrative pillar in the world of arts and letters. In a world that is all too ephemeral, these three great institutions bring solidity and indeed humanity. And so I thank the Huntington Library and Gardens for hosting us tonight. I thank my own institution, Claremont Graduate University, for its enduring and significant commitment to the arts and humanities. I thank the many donors and community members who have supported the Tufts Poetry Awards for over a quarter century. And most of all, I thank the poets, particularly Patricia Smith and Danica Kelly, for composing such poignant poetry that draws us all together tonight. I had the pleasure of hearing them read at the award ceremony last night uh, that we had at the CGU President's House. It was a genuinely unforgettable experience for me to be in the presence of two women who speak so powerfully to the deepest parts of the human experience and soul. It's become fashionable this past year and, ha and a half. I'm not sure what all has happened in the past year and a half, you can guess. But it's become fashionable to say that poetry matters more now than ever. I'm not so sure that's entirely true. Poetry certainly mattered plenty when Phyllis Wheatley used poetry to insist upon the humanity of people of color at the beginning of our national project. But even if our times are not singular, they are certainly unique. And we each need to fiercely defend every institution that will in turn fiercely defend what it is that makes us all truly human, of which poetry is paramount. So thank you for being here tonight and lending your support to the Tufts Poetry Awards. Thank you to the remarkable poets whose work we not only celebrate, but whose work make the, these awards possible and meaningful. And now let me turn the microphone over to my dear colleague and friend, Laurieanne Farrell, who when she is not doing an astoundingly good job as director of the Tufts Poetry Awards, also finds time to be the McGuire Distinguished Professor of Humanities and the chair of the English department at Claremont Graduate University. Thank you for being here, Laurieann. This is like a wedding. We just give thanks and thanks and thanks. Thank you, Patrick. 
Um, and thank you all for being here. Let me add my thanks to, uh, and my welcome to Patrick's. Um, especially thank you to not only CGU, but the Huntington, and I wanna shout out a few names here, specifically um, Steve Hindle, Susan Turner Lowe and the Huntington event staff. Um, I also want to thank Larry Wilson, and he knows why I'm thanking him. Giving out the Kingsley and Kate Tufts Poetry Awards are simply the best thing Claremont Graduate University does. I'm not overstating this. Well, maybe I am just a bit, because CGU does a number of great things, and we do them well. But we are justly if inordinately proud of being the home for an extraordinary bequest from an extraordinary woman, Kate Tufts, who more than a quarter century ago started looking around for a school who would help her pay tribute to her great love for her husband and the poetry he both loved and wrote on the off hours. And therein lies the tale. Kingsley Tufts dreamed of writing poetry full time, but of course he had bills to pay which he did in his day job as a Los Angeles shipyard executive. He died after hosting his annual New Year's party, which always featured Kingsley reading aloud from his and others' poetic works. Kate Tufts wanted to help other poets turn their avocation into vocation. She contacted several well-known Ivy League institutions who didn't return the call. The president of what was then called the Claremont Graduate School did. Thanks to their collaboration today, CGU is home to one of the largest poetry prizes in the world. The Kingsley Tufts Poetry Award gives $100,000 annually for a book of poetry by a poet in mid-career. The Kate Tufts Discovery Awards gives $10,000 for a first book by a poet of genuine promise. This year, the Kingsley was awarded to Patricia Smith for incendiary art. The Kate, yes, let's stop from this. And the Kate has gone to Danica Kelly for bestiary. Last. <laughs> Last night we honored both poets at a private dinner held at the university. But tonight we want the world, and this is the world, right? To celebrate them. Kate Tuff said a lot of quotable things. We love to quote her. But one of my favorites out of many is, and I quote, I just want to give poets a little breathing room and a little recognition, a little something to pay the bills. That little something is really something. So before we get started, I do want to recognize a member of Kate's family here this evening. Dan Clement, are you here? He, yes! Dan is a supporter of all our events, and when you see him at the reception afterwards, um, just ask him about his college-bound high school project. Now, our winning poets will be introduced by two of the distinguished poets who served on our judging panel this year, Elena Byrne and Don Cher. So I'm going to tell you just a little bit about them, and then I'm going to get out of all the poets' way. Pushcart Prize winner Elena Corinna Byrne is the former 12-year regional director of the Poetry Society of America. She is a freelance teacher and editor and the poetry consultant and moderator for the Los Angeles Times Festival of Books, as well as literary programs director for the Ruskin Art Club. She is the author of The Flammable Bird, Mask, and Squander, as well as dozens and dozens of reviews and poetry publications. Elena has just completed a collection of essays entitled Voyeur Hour, Meditations on Poetry, Art, and Desire. She, and one of her poems, has been starring in a magnificent electronic billboard at the corner of La Brea and Santa Monica. Um, if you haven't seen it, drive there. Is it still up? Yes, it's gorgeous. She will be introducing Danica. Don Cher is the editor of the magazine Poetry, and the author, translator, and editor of 12 books. He has, recent, he has received three National Magazine Awards for his work at the magazine, and a Vita Award for his contributions to American literature and literary community. Both these marvelous poets who will be introducing our winning poets tonight have served with great distinction on our judging panel for three years, Dawn as chair for two. We have to let them go, but we couldn't let them go without making them do one more job for us. 
So I will now let them do that job. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Lori. And thank you to the Claremont Graduate University um, and also to Genevieve Kaplan, who does so much of um, the work. And thank you to the poets who have been a constant source of inspiration for me. I think that's the best part of the job. Um, you come across this amazing array of writers that um, really teach you something. And um, that was my favorite part of the job. I felt like I was constantly learning something. So Donica Kelly is the PhD professor at St. Bonaventure University, where she teaches creative writing, the author of a chapbook, Avarium, and the full-length collection, um, Bestiary from Grey Wolf 2016, which was, among other distinctions, the winner of the 2015 Kaveh Kanem Poetry Prize, the 2017 Hurston Wright Award for Poetry, long listed for the National Book Award, one of the New York Times Best Poetry Collections of 2016, a finalist for the Lambda Literary Award, and as you know, we're happy to celebrate here tonight the winner of the Kate Tufts Award in Poetry. If poetry is instant metaphysics, as Gaston Bachelard insists, evoking on the spot the dialectic of joy and suffering, then poetry has met its match in this first beautiful book by Donica Kelly. Bessieri is an accomplishment of contrasts and fresh equations. Sadness, quote, is full of sadness when you have only just discovered how clouds move. The sky is full of words and the speakers Quote, sister says tender into the phone like a woman who believes only in the idea of a woman. Between song and captured silence, divination and derivation, the past and the future, Kelly apprehends what is dark undone and brings it back to us transformed in the light like her bird cutting the sky. Kelly declares, what menagerie are we? what we've made of ourselves. What is made with astonishing fresh clarity is a story weave of lyric poems that couple the real and the mythologized. A hybrid other emerges there, the wilderness of self where, quote, with the rough calculus of walking, we find angst leads to authenticity and vulnerability is power. Take this excerpt's hallucinatory overthrow of the senses as your new tool for seeing the world anew. Kelly says, in your ear, the black bear winters. And believe me, once he winters, he wakes and reclaims spring. Please give a warm welcome to our Kate Tufts winner. Hey, y'all. <laughs> How's it going? I like some good. <laughs> uh, I'm very, I'm very excited uh, to be here. I'm excited to have been awarded uh, the Kate Tufts. Uh, thank you so much to um, Lorianne and, and Genevieve. And I'm also like, I'm so excited. I'm just like, everything just feels like so amazing tonight. Uh, I'm going to try to keep it together. Uh, I'm just... Just reading with Patricia Smith. Cool, cool, cool. Everything's fine. Uh, <laughs> um, I almost chickened out and read a different thread in the book, but I think I'm going to read work that's a little bit more difficult. And I'm also going to uh, share some new work because part of what I understand is the, the ethos of the Kate Tufts is an investment in my future as a poet, right? And so I want to maybe preview <laughs> some of uh, what's in the what's in the pike uh, okay it's funny I, I almost never I, re, I I often start with this poem but uh, there are things that I usually say that I don't think I need to say right now so I'm just gonna I'm gonna start with fourth grade autobiography 
We live in Los Angeles, California. We have a front yard and a backyard. My favorite things are cartwheels, salted plums, and playing catch with my dad. I squeeze the grass and dirt between my fingers, eat my tongue white. He launches every ball into orbit. Every ball drops like an anvil, heavy and straight into my hands. I am afraid of riots and falling and the dark. The sunset of flames ringing our block, groceries and Asian-owned storefronts. No one to catch me. Midnight walks from his room to mine. I believe in the devil. I have a sister and a brother and a strong headlock. We have a dog named Spunky, fawn and black. We have an olive tree, a black walnut tree, a fig tree. We lie in the grass and wonder who writes in the sky. I lie in the grass and imagine my name, a cloud drifting, Saturday dance parties, everyone drunk on pink panties, screwdrivers, and Canadian club. Dominoes and spades, Al Green and Mac-10. Sometimes, Mama dances with the dog. Sometimes, my dad dances with me. I am careful not to touch. He is careful to smile with his whole face. There's a sequence in the book, uh, and the, the structure of the title is love poem, colon, and then some kind of mythological animal. And I like to describe the mythological animal because I think it's useful for us to be on the same page about which iteration of the thing I'm talking about. <laughs> and so for this poem, uh, Love Poem Chimera, the version of the chimera that I was thinking of when writing this poem has the body of a lion, and then the tail is a snake. At the end of the tail is like a snake's head, right? I love people who are like, mm -hmm. sure. <laughs> All right, yeah. It makes a kind of intuitive sense. Uh, but then in the middle of the back is, the, is a goat's head. I just think it's useful to think about. Love poem Chimera. I thought myself lion and serpent. Thought myself body enough for two, for we found comfort in never being lonely. What burst from my back, from my bones, what lived along the ridge, from crown to crown, from mane to forked tongue beneath the skin, what clamor we made in the birthing, what hiss and rumble at the splitting, at the horns and beard, at the glottal bleat, what bridges our back, what strong neck, what bright eye, what menagerie are we, what we've made of ourselves. self-portrait as a door. Oh, and there's a little thing that you might, I don't know, like in other parts of the country, people kind of remember this. Um, like around 2011, like new, around New Year's um, in Arkansas, which is where I, where my family moved to after we uh, left California, left LA, uh, a number of, they found like all of these dead blackbirds in a field. <laughs> And they had no idea how the birds had died. Um, they just found them in a field one morning. And it turns out that they were startled from their roosts in the night and like flew into like the side of buildings. Um, and in the part of New York State where I live, I remember saying this and, and a woman said, those were our birds. <laughs> because they wintered like those birds migrated south to winter. Uh, she felt that very keenly in a way that I had not anticipated. Uh, Self-portrait as a door. All the birds die of blunt force trauma, of barn, of wire, of slow or yield children at play. You are a sign, are a plank, are a raft, are a felled oak. You are a handle, are a turn, are a bit of brass lovingly polished. What birds, what bugs, what soft hand come knocking, what echo, what empty, what room in need of a picture, a mirror, a bit of paint on the wall. There is a hooked rug. There is a hand hard as you are hard pounding the door. There is the doormat, owl eye patched by a boot by a body with a tree for a hand. What roosts, what burrows, what scrambles at the pound. There is a you on the other side, cold and white as the room in need of a window or an eye. There is your hand on the door, which is now the door pretending to be a thing that opens. So Pegasus, we all, like most people are like, oh yeah, the winged horse, sure, right? It's cute. Um, 
what I think most people don't know is that Pegasus was born when Perseus, Theseus, I just don't even want to hold it in my mind which one of them it was. Um, usually someone knows. So Perseus, I believe, cuts off the head of Medusa. Is that the one? Some people are like, sure. Yeah, we can go with that. Uh, and so from Medusa's neck springs Pegasus. Right. Because <laughs> Medusa was at least originally a mortal woman like me. And from her body, a horse with wings that a man could ride emerged. There's another, there's a, Pegasus has a sibling. We'll sort of circle around to that in just a little bit. Um, but what I, I just, the gestation process is what I find troubling. <laughs> there's a lot that I find troubling, but that is just like an ancillary troubling bit. Love poem, Pegasus. Fold, fully grown from my mother's neck, her severed head, the silenced snakes. Call this freedom, my first cry, a beating of wings, abandon. Call me orphan before I even know what a mother is. I think myself arising, feather and hoof, neigh and caw, and you always on my back. You bear a sword and shield, remind me of her labor, her stoning gaze. What beast will your blade free next? What call will you loose from another woman's throat? handsome is. In the dream, my father hides inside another man's body. I know him by his hands, but how am I a child? And this wall against my back, how long has it been a wall? My father follows me, handsome as a close friend, a tree in bloom. I build a room to hold him. He picks all the locks. I scream, don't scream. I run, stand still. I am a forest, a field. I crumble and shift. I wake my breath deep inside the earth. Yeah, I think this is right. All right, I'm going to read this poem about going to therapy. <laughs> Everyone should go. Uh, if you aren't going, consider it. Uh, which I think is right. Little box. The woman you love is afraid she is hurting you. This is the source of her fear. You are afraid to say, I am hurting. You are crying. You are afraid your parents will discover that you are crying again and send you again to therapy, where a woman with long hair and a long skirt will point to the dollhouse and ask where the mother doll sleeps and the father, and if they have a child where the child doll sleeps. You speak in therapy. Every statement begins, I feel, even when you mean, why are you hurting me? You'd rather be a simpler animal. You try to imagine what the bear feels, the seal, the otter, always a little group of three. You worry they are not, in fact, simpler, but you are sure they are never lonely. You hate your loneliness as you hate it yourself as a child. You are bored with your hatred. You want her to stop hurting you. You want to say, I love you again and again. This will change nothing. And you've already said it. When you were a child in therapy, you understood where each doll went. You learned not to cry. There is no teacher now to tell your parents in any way your mother doesn't remember you and you are settling into hating your father, though you are afraid you are as careless and cruel as they taught you to be. You will see your therapist in two weeks. Her hair is short and she is from the same city as the woman you love. You will tell her you are sad and hurting. You will be matter of fact. You will think of the seal, a mother perhaps, how she might be lonely for a lost pup. But there will be another and she will forget the one that was eaten by an orca or polar bear or neglect. You will tell your therapist none of this. You will no longer speak to the woman who has your heart. You will put her in the room farthest away from your own. She will sleep where the father should be. Uh, and this is the last poem that I'll read from, from the book. Uh, I think that's right. I just like saying, I think that's right. Y'all don't know. Y'all don't know what's going on. <laughs> All right. Uh, love poem, Danica. This is a spring of shambles, of meadows slow to flower, of fire sooting the underbrush, and love, I am lonely as a bear. 
I am no good at bearish things. Fish are forage. My hands are too small and slow to clip the salmon thick in the heat of spawn. I do not know where berries are or honey or campers or the greening branch. I am tired of mounting this hill alone. Love, how do I gain what was lost in winter? So three new poems uh, that feel a little bit tricky but that I do enjoy reading. <laughs> so, uh, And so they're from uh, a new s project. We'll see. I don't know if it's more than that, but it's something. It seems to be a thing. Danica questions the oracle. Who hid my dad in the mountain? impoverished where he would remain invisible and rationed, not on milk and honey, but on bologna and saltines until he grew strong enough to kill the father. Which father? Do I mean his daddy exiled for the rest of his diabetic days to a closet and a house with no power, no water, where my dad, his sisters and his brothers caught for a time by the crack rock and the pipe lighting up in the dark lived? Surely not his daddy oracle. Surely not. How long was he the youngest? How long was he a child? What God swallowed him whole? The God perhaps who split his mother in two or took his brother with a bullet from another father's gun in the sunlight in the afternoon? Did he really hold his dying brother's hand, Oracle? The brother who wanted only an apology on my dad's behalf? Who held him when his mother died? Who told him of a heaven where dead mothers and brothers go? Oh, the pigeons. What of the pigeons, Oracle? Did he tend them, watch them rise from the roof of the house with no power or water but a daddy in a closet, his sisters and brothers flaring in the rock light? Did he delight in their return? The pigeons, I mean. Did he ever delight, Oracle, in anything a child might? Did he look for his name in the sky? Did he ride a bike made from junk parts in the south central L.A. sun fast as a boy might? Surely he did that, Oracle. Surely that. And when he rose like an improbable stone from the father's gut, whichever father I mean here, whichever father makes sense, the siblings, the pigeons, his daddy in exile, his name in the sky, when he rose with the stone of himself and his hand, covered in bile and mucus, free now of someone more powerful than the child he surely once was, did he know the terrible thing he would become? So Pegasus had a sibling. And that sibling was either a winged boar. This is what gets me, it's the either. It's either, <laughs> it's like, why don't they know? A winged boar or a golden giant. And if it's the golden giant, then the golden giant goes on to Father Gerion or Gerion, the red monster that had the cattle that, and Heracles murdered him and stole the cattle. For, right, so there's like a, there's a lot going on there. Um, I just don't, like, those things aren't the same. <laughs> it's really the point here. Uh, portrait of my father is a winged boar. When his mama dies in a wreck, from her open body springs my dad, whose name I refuse to say as he refuses his father, the half-known man who sired him. In the dry L.A. light, the boy, my dad, turns so that he is caught. One way, a winged boar. Another, a giant gold blade of a man both high-skulled, thick-maned, a juvenile without a sounder, a boy without a mother. He recognizes himself only in the man, carves himself into golden armor, but the rutting fact of him, the curved tooth, the thick neck and beating wings, trembles beneath his skin. Whatever sheen the California sun burnishes out of his body, whatever good work his thickening hand compels, whatever woman he touches in the afternoon on the roof, he cannot deny his firstborn, his red fledgling, her many heads and hands, what he makes for her. A junk bike she loves, cattle red in the field, a mirror, a red wreckage of her body. Uh, and this is the last poem, so I want to thank you all for your for your attention tonight. Um, brood. My chest is earth. 
I meant to write, my chest is warm, but earth will do to exhume a heart beat. I meant to write, breathe. Did you know I was alive the whole time? I was alive in the ground, but torpor, torpor. Slowed beat, my chest filled like a jar with dirt. I mean, dearth. For slow months at rest in the hole I'd made in myself, a frozen ground, a ground in thaw. I mean, spring is coming. I mean, I push the wet dirt with my mandible. I mean, jaw, jaw, y'all. I know I am not a nymph in exhumation but would you please explain this half-remembered light? Thank you. Sounds like y'all already know about Patricia Smith. Um, <clears throat> then you know that she was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize this year, just this week, announced. So <clears throat> it, must be a, it must be a great week for Patricia, but it's a great week for people who adore and read poetry, as we here do. And so the 2018 Kingsley Tufts Award is awarded to the indefatigable Patricia Smith for her book, Incendiary Art. The novelist Marlon James reading it calls it the fire this time, and indeed her book is made out of the smoldering narratives of American history urgently told with visceral sonic mastery, as you'll hear. The poems are one after the other, a fire with grief and rage, but more than that, they give us ways to reimagine the ahistorical narrative that so many Americans tragically cling to. No page of the calendar of our history goes unread in Patricia Smith's work and in this book. And for that reason, the book movingly addresses not only our past, but what is happening around us right now. And yet, it transcends the grimness of the news it forcefully rearticulates. Black lives matter most, she writes, when they are in motion. Please join me in welcoming Patricia Smith. It has been a very good week. <laughs> um, I want to thank Claremont, everyone affiliated with uh, the Kingsley. Um, and the thing that I've taken note of most in the last few days is this sense of being, um, being asked to join this family. I mean, there's a, there's a lineage. I was just looking at the poster over here, so many poets that I know and love. And uh, Lori keeps saying, come back, come back, come back. Uh, and I really feel like I fit into this circle of arms now. And I really am appreciative of that because we don't get much of that. Um, I am going to, one of the major movements in incendiary art, I'm always telling my students to listen for the voices that they're not hearing. And one of the voices that I didn't hear very much, the voices of mothers whose children, uh, sons and daughters had been murdered many times, but not always at the hands of the police. So I tried to um, put as much of that mother's voice into the book as I could. So I'm going to read uh, the first segment of the poem, Sagas of the Accidental Saint, and uh, also afterwards a couple of the cases that you'll hear, and I try to address these cases from the mother's point of view. I don't expect you'll recognize my voice. I don't believe this saga I've suppressed will ever sound familiar. I am just a stooped and accidental saint. No choice except to strain the limits of my throat. I am the mama weep beneath the fold. That paragraph you skip, the wink of gold inside a rotted mouth, that shredding note of grief. Excuse what's inexcusable in me. The shifting wildfire tinted weave, my ankles blue with fluid, how I grieve in gospel you can't clutch. A fusible display of double negatives I spew whenever someone says my child is gone and then goes on to pile the blame upon my child for being gone. 
Or maybe you believe the wretched mess is rightly traced right back to me, whose body housed the crime. My daughter out of dollars, out of time, my son just seeking ways to be erased. So many ways they stride into the line of gunfire, tease the trigger, crave the shot, just living through their days as if they're not about to die. He totes a paper bag of wine or tussles laughing with his kid or rolls a joint or asks his boo to braid his hair while lazing on the stoop or dares to glare when someone shoves. She fights against the holes around her throat or someone looks the same as someone else or sits inside her car or someone else's car or leaves a jar a door she should have closed. He plays a game of hoops to clear his head or doesn't raise his hands, or raises them, or doesn't stop, or does, or, when commanded, fails to drop his wallet, keys, or phone. He sets ablaze a heap of trash, somebody's car or store, while shouting slogans meant to make you care that he's alive. She's killed if she's not there, although she said she'd be, or there before she should have been, or on her way to work, or coming home not walking like she should, not walking down the street she normally would. He walks too close behind. You have to jerk your purse out of the way. You palm the mace. He passes, spitting lyric, vile and blue, not giving dams that he's offending you. All you can remember is his race. You ask him to succumb. He dares decline. The situation quickly falls apart. A weapon's raised to line up with his heart because he feels entitled to his spine. She fumbles in her pocket for some change or jumps the A-train turnstile on a dare. She mumbles like her mind is not all there or titters in a way you think is strange. He wrecks his Chevy, waves for help. He calls the nine, the one, the one. He's waiting wrong. The folks around him said he didn't belong. He coughs or sneezes, looks away. He brawls with brothers, sisters, father, wife. He waves a Walmart toy, or he can't find his place in line. He laughs too loud. He can't retrace his steps. He droops his pants. He misbehaves. She turns her back or whirls around or could be packing, could be wanted, could be strong enough to snap your neck. She moves all wrong. He wanders into someone else's hood in colors that he struggles to explain. He prances, strides, he's plotting an escape, he stops and spins on you, he's here to rape your daughter, or he scoffs when you complain about his smell. He crafts a sign, he parks behind your Chevy, thrusts his massive fist into or through the air, he wakes up pissed but right on time, then smokes a blunt or arcs his brow when someone asks, you good? He waits his turn or takes a break. He takes a leak, he frightens everyone with his physique, the situation's bound to escalate. So many ways they're asking not to be. She's wearing out her welcome being black when no one asked her to. You've seen her lack of grace, the space she occupies, her glee when chicken, weed, or welfare checks roll in. He goes to class. He graduates. He takes the seat right next to you. His shoulder makes you quake inside. You simply don't know when he'll blow. She shops beneath the winking eye of video, but then pays with a card that can't be hers. His chest and arms are scarred with scrape and blood tattoos, so why untie the noose shaped like his neck? His clothes are blue or red. He wants your job. He scoped your wife. He craves your home, your cash, your life. That textbook in his hands, not fooling you. She hawks and spits. She begs for change. She blows a harp. She blows through blow. She blows her chance, a victim yet again of circumstance. He's fighting back, but everybody knows that he's too coarse, too dumb, too street, too black, too dense, too doomed, too thick, too much of those, too vicious pose, too quick to come to blows, too likely he could spark your heart attack. He flares his nostrils, hides his hands. He flees without explaining why. She lifts, she steals, she swipes, she grabs, she snatches, cuts a deal. He stumbles, trips. He trips a wire. He sees too much. She needs too much. He feels too much. Her skin's too mud. His skin's too light. He fights too dirty. Fights for breath. The savage nights are huge with him. The voodoo in his touch. He shoots himself while handcuffed to a pole. Or hangs himself while hanging from a tree. Or wrings his neck, although his hands aren't free. He always seems to fail at self-control. He's monster, ogre, he's the looming threat, insisting he didn't do that thing he did, denying that she'd hidden what she hid, confusing you by getting so upset. 
He claims he's innocent. He files a case. He lives too large, too long. He must believe that he is white or free. He's so naive. With every step he takes, he falls from grace. He steps inside or out or through or down. She bellows, jumps or hisses, struts or spins. He stalks the street, steps off a curb. His sin should be enough to drive him out of town, where he'd be out of sight and out of mind and out of bounds, but thankfully not out of range. And if you think he's all about the kill, the drops, the guns, and gangster grind, you know for sure as soon as you see me, his mama, grieving ugly, wailing about my child, my child, and plucking Jesus out of every bag. You just can't see why he deserves such stupid love, my wailing thrust, each Lord have mercy on my baby's soul, my sad theatrics as my child goes cold, and then the hungry cameras readjust my howls, until it's not my child who's dead, but something feral, edged in leak, a threat to shrubbery and Sundays. While he's wet and seeping into street, they frame his head and mine inside a single shot and ask my nappy hair and bulging eyes just what I think. I keen, implode on cue. They cut the camera back to frame the blooded mask and splay. You don't remember what I say or hear his name, but you are borderline obsessed with my collapse, my crumpled wine and holy ghosted flail, the matinee of mama. You are entertained until you aren't. And then I'm just an open maw, a blur and tongue. You shouldn't waste your awe on my unleashed display of overkill. Enjoy the blackish bruiser dripping bile, the spittle spewing me, still bellowing, my Lord, my Lord, why would you let this thing disrupt your day? I disappear. And while I'm relegated to an anecdote on way to nothing, all you can recall is sputtered gospel woe and cotter wall that corpse the tightened wire around my throat. That's my son collapsed there. My son crumpled there, my son lying there, my son positioned there, my daughter repositioned there, my daughter as exhibit A there, my daughter dumped over there, my son hidden away there, my son blue there, my son dangling there, my son caged there, my daughter on the gurney there, on the slab there, in the drawer there, my daughter splayed there, my son locked down there, my son hanging over there, my son bleeding out there, my son growing frigid there, my daughter deposited there, my son inside the chalk there, my daughter being bagged there, my son on the slab there, my son crushed there, my son rearranged there, my son crumpled in the door there, my daughter's neck shrinking in the noose there, my son's left eye over there, my son as exhibit B there, my son behind the wheel there, my son under the wheels there, my son slumped over the wheel there, my son, my daughter blooded and not moving, in the doorway, on the stoop, down the block, in front of her kids, just inside the barbershop, face down in in the street, outside the bodega, inside the bodega, in the back alley behind the bodega, on the videotape, a block from home, leaving home, hanging out at home, in the schoolyard, on the blacktop, in his bed, in her kitchen, in my arms, in my arms, in my arms. That's my son, shot to look thug. That's my daughter, shot to look more animal, shot as kill, shot as prey, shot as conquest, shot as solution, shot as lesson, shot as warning, shot as comeback, shot as payback, shot for sport, Shot for history, that's my son not being alive anymore there. That's my child coming to rest one layer beneath the surface of the rest of my life there. Thank you. August 19, 2014, St. Louis, Missouri. Kajim Powell, 25, was accused of shoplifting donuts and energy drinks. Police said the mentally disturbed man approached with a knife in an overhand grip. They shot him dead 15 seconds after they arrived. Video shows that Powell's hands were at his side. I am the mother of the darkest magician. His thousand limbs thrash in and out of your practice sightline. He is always behind, beside, and in front of you. He lunges for your neck while whistling on a side street three blocks away. Firepower throbs in every finger of his bound and idle hands. 
No matter where he is, he is the leading man in the stuttering convenience store video. If he is not there, he will be. If he hasn't, he is about to. If a blade's not in his hand, it's in his hand. If his hands are up, they're clawing through his pockets for something. If he's screeching, don't shoot, he's clearly saying, please, I'm tired. Help me fall down. March 3, 2014, Iberia Parish, Louisiana. Police say that Victor White III, 22, shot himself while handcuffed in the back of a police cruiser. November 19, 2013, Durham, North Carolina. Police say that Jesus Herrera, 17, shot himself while handcuffed in the back of a police cruiser. July 29, 2012, Jonesboro, Arkansas. Police say that Chavis Carter, 21, shot himself while handcuffed in the back of a police cruiser. He reached back and found his own hands with his own hands worked his bound fingers to set his free fingers loose, then used that shackled hand to free the other shackled hand, and the freed shackled hand, still shackled, was still bound to the other hand once both were free. Once free in the shackles, the shackled hand turned to the matter of the gun, which couldn't be there because they'd searched my baby twice, and a gun is a pretty big thing unless it isn't, unless it is dreamed alive by hands that believe they are no longer shackled. Stunned in cuffs, but free and searching, the left and right hands found a gun with a stink like voodoo, a gun that couldn't have been there, wasn't there, but was. The left-handed him used a cuffed hand, which could have either been left or right, since both were free, to root around for a trigger and fire a bullet right into his left-handed head. Impossible, but not really, since the preferred killing hand may have preferred its shackles. The policeman, who had searched my baby twice and cuffed both his free and unfree hands behind his back before his hands found his own hands and pulled, Heard no human sound at all during all that frantic magic. No, damn, as my boy struggled to get his left shackled hand to do what his right shackled hand wouldn't do. No frenzied pound of one bracing foot against the door. No grunt or whoop of glee to mark all those times he slipped out of custody and in again. But they did hear the bang of the gun, the gun that wasn't there but was, just when it sent that bullet into the right side of his left-handed head. Sounds like sacrifice, they thought. Slumped, eyes cocked and undone, my child was amazed at the sweet hoodoo he had managed. Both left and right hands were shackled and free behind him. There was an eerie, perfect circle of smoke in his hair. Suicide they both said, at the very same time. And since it was odd how they had reached the same conclusion, they smiled and shook their heads. Noting the shackles, they praised their God in the light of miracle, while the boy who couldn't have done what he did, but did, bled down to zero. Guess he couldn't take it, one of the alive said to the other. He didn't mean wearing the shackles. He meant not wearing them. It's just two more of these. March 12, 2012, Pasadena, California. Kendrick McDade, 19, was chased and shot seven times by two police officers after a 911 caller falsely reported being robbed at gunpoint by two black men. McDade's final words were, why did they shoot me? As the moon tangled its beams and grew monstrous over his body, he wanted that answer. As usual, I arrived too late. He had already dispersed and become an awkward hour. Son of the mother of mistake, his timing and route were askew. But 
because walk, but because upright, because Africa, because decision, because Tuesday, because loaded gun, because running, because too black, because identified, because uniform, because breathless, because unable, because America, because yo mama, because Mississippi, because uniform, because Obama, because the chase, because unarmed, because convenient, because mistaken, because threatened, because ritual, because no one will miss you, because no one will miss you, because no no one will, because beast, because innocent, because they could, because they could, because they could, because they... I usually give my boys names anyone could remember. Scapegoat, Target, Perp Walk. The name Kendrick so squashed his potential, he should have been victim, identify, bullseye. How about accident? Perfect. I never had children. I just had accidents. September 14th, 2013, Bradfield Farms, North Carolina. After being involved in a traffic accident, Jonathan Farrell, 24, knocked on the door of a nearby house for help. The woman inside called the police. They arrived and shot him. 10 times. My son said, I just had an accident. I I need to use the phone. She said, you're black. My son said, it'll only take a minute. I need to call the police. She heard, call the police. My son said, I I know it's late, but I I just had an accident. She said, 911. He said, Okay, then, you'll call 911? She said, you're black. The police said, is he black? She said, he's black. When the gun arrived, it said, I just had an accident. The gun 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 said, I just had an accident. Once I put this baby in the ground, I'm ready. This means war. Geneva Reed Veal, mother of Sandra Bland, addressing the congregation at Johnson Philip All Faiths Church, Prairie View, Texas. I don't expect you'll recognize my voice. No matter that I populate your world with demons and obstructions, dangerous assumptions. I am the mother of the hung, the pistol whipped, the misted head, the hands that found the hands, the tasered crazy girl, and all the magic reel that you can stand. I thought perhaps I'd let you see that I am flesh and bone and pulse, that in the night I wail with wanting them. And yes, I know I entertain you, digitized, my break and fall rewound, replayed, and tabbed. But now I fight my own collapse, that ugly twist of grief that makes you laugh. I'm here to say their bodies weren't at war with you. I'm here to say their bodies weren't at war with you. I'm here to say their wars were in their bodies. And the battlefield was always yours. Was always yours was all. Thank you.
I don't have words. Danica, Patricia, would you please stand up again? I want to give you one more round of applause. I told you it's the best thing we do. So thank you very much for being here. We have a reception outside, and I know that we will want to mingle, and I know you get a chance to speak to Patricia and Danica. And um, thank you again. Good night.